I've worked with this really great powerlifting coach for the last couple of months. It's been great. My programming has been more dialed in. I had somebody who can pay attention to the little mistakes that I'm making that I would otherwise overlook. And I've made progress and that's been nice. After training for a decade now, what I've realized is that the biggest thing is just get in the gym and don't miss reps. You know, like put your reps in. If you do that, then the actual program that you're on, it might help you a little bit in the short run. But if you just put your reps in and don't miss workouts and you do that for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, how far would you get as long as you're doing a reasonable program? Probably pretty far. Even if you're doing you're on the best coach, you probably get 95% of your potential out. I think a lot of times like people want to get in shape and they're like, what knee sleeves do I need? What's the best protein powder? And it's like, dude, just don't miss workouts for two years and then get back to me. I mean, that's the thing that, that makes 98% of the difference is are you putting your reps in? Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because I need them for me, because I want to wake up every day and watch a video that puts me in a mindset to believe in myself more and go off and accomplish amazing things and attack the day, and I hope that this video does that for you as well. So today, let's get some incredible motivation from the one and only James Clear. Enjoy. Decide the type of person you want to be, and then you prove it to yourself with small wins. And the more small wins or the more small habits that you perform, the more votes that you cast for that identity, the more you build up evidence of being that kind of person. And eventually you start to take pride in that aspect of your identity. And man, once we start to take pride in a part of our story, like it's much easier to stick with those habits. If you take pride in the size of your biceps, you'll like never skip arm day at the gym, you know, <laughs> or if you take pride in how your hair looks, you have this like long hair care routine, all these hair care habits and you do them every day. Whatever aspect of your identity that you're trying to reinforce, that's kind of the, the story. You can also phrase it as a question. So for example, rather than saying, I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts, you could have this question that's related to the identity you want to build and you kind of carry it around with you all day. And like in this example, maybe the question is, what would a healthy person do? And so you're just kind of walking around all day asking yourself, you know, what should I get for lunch? Well, what would a healthy person do? Or should I take the an Uber? Or should I walk to the next meeting? Well, what would a healthy person do? And you just kind of like go around your day and try to make decisions that you feel like support that identity. But I think you start with who is the type of person I wish to become. So let's say I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. And then the second step is prove it to yourself with small wins. So which small actions, what little habits cast votes for being the kind of person who doesn't miss workouts. Well, maybe one thing is rather than doing a 45 minute workout when I only have 10 minutes, I reduce the scope and stick to the schedule and I do a couple sprints or I do, you know, five sets of pushups or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so you find ways to reinforce your desired identity, even if it's small, especially in the beginning, because if you can show up consistently, if you kind of master the art of showing up and performing these small habits, you build up this sense of momentum. You kind of start to reinforce and shape that new identity. And the more evidence that you have for it, at some point you kind of cross this invisible threshold where you're like, oh, I guess I am that kind of person. You know, like if you go out and shoot a basketball for five minutes, you don't think, oh, I'm a basketball player. But if you do it every day for six months or a year or two years, like at some point you cross this invisible line. You're like, you know, I guess playing basketball is kind of part of who I am. So yeah. I think you're trying to accumulate actions that support your desired identity. Your concept of getting 1% better is much more believable for most people. And so just address that for a second. Why, why 1% better every day and how does a habit do that? Sure. So First of all, I think there's no reason that you can't be really ambitious, right? Like I consider myself to be a very ambitious person. I think it's just that you're oscillating or switching between these two modes. You know, like when you're in planning mode, when you're in strategy mode, sure, you can be very ambitious um, and be very um, aggressive and, uh, you know, stretching yourself and reaching. But when it comes time to take action and execute, uh, you have to scale it down to something that you can achieve that day. You know, like the in in one sense, the biggest unit of time you could ever do something is about a single day because then you got to go to sleep, you know, and then you have to wake up again and do it the next day. So unless you're playing, you know, at some point there's a limit. You can only stay up for 48 hours or 72 hours, like, you know, and then you break. So mm -hmm. 
that's the largest possible unit that you could ever do a single thing in. And I think more realistically, most of the time, the truth is, you know, you got about an hour, or maybe you got two hours to work on this and then you got to go move on to something else. So we don't have big chunks of, chunks of time available to us. We need to scale things down into pieces that we can actually work on and execute. So the way that I think about it is when making plans, think big. When making progress, think small. And Mm -hmm. getting 1% better each day is a way to encourage that. Excellence, a lot of the time, maybe we can even say most of the time, is not actually about radical change. It's about a commitment to accruing small improvements day in and day out. Secondly, and I think this is also crucial, it encourages you to focus on trajectory rather than position. Right? There's a lot of discussion about position in life. How much money is in the bank account? What is the number on the scale? What is the current stock price? What are the quarterly earnings? There's all this measurement around our current position. But what getting 1% better each day encourages is to focus on your trajectory instead. Am I getting better? Is the arrow pointed up and to the right or have we flatlined? Am I getting 1% better or 1% worse? Because if you're on a good trajectory, all you need is time. Right? If you have good habits, time becomes your ally. You just need to let time work for you. But if you have bad habits, time becomes your enemy. And every day that clicks by, you kind of dig the hole a little bit deeper. And mm-hmm. so it's very much at the core. It's about encouraging you to focus on trajectory rather than position. One of the phrases I use, and I have this in the book, is that habits are the compound interests of self-improvement. So it's like the same way that for compound interest you know, accrues through finance, your, the effects of your habits multiply over time. And so often these choices that you make, they're these little 1% improvements for you or against you each day, and they're very easy to overlook on a daily basis, right? Like, what, what really is the difference between eating a burger and fries or a salad and chicken for lunch? Mm. You don't really it see a, a lot. lot better. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> it tastes that's amazing actually, in the moment. That's actually a crucial point uh, that I cover in the book, which is that habits that are immediately satisfying are more likely to be repeated. And so pretty much any behavior produces multiple outcomes across time, right? Like if you eat a donut right now, it's tasty mm, and sugary, so good. but in the long run, you gain weight. And so the, the immediate outcome is favorable. The long-term outcome is unfavorable. With good habits, it's often the reverse, right? Like you go to the gym right now and it takes effort. You sweat, you have to work hard. You have to sacrifice outcome, your time for Netflix and chill to go train. The immediate outcome is unfavorable. But the ultimate outcome, you're in shape and in a, you know, a year or a month or whatever, right. is favorable. And so the challenge for building good habits and breaking bad ones is often finding a way to pull the long-term consequences of your bad habits into the immediate moment so you feel a little bit of the pain right now and want to avoid it, and the long-term rewards of your good habits into the immediate moment so that you have a reason to repeat it again in the future. Each behavior casts a vote for the type of person that you want to become. And if you cast enough votes for that type of identity, you start to believe that about yourself, right? Like if you you go to church for 20 years, you believe that you're religious. You study Spanish every Tuesday for 30 minutes, you believe Mm -hmm. that you are studious. Um, So in that way, your habits provide evidence of your desired identity. And I think that that is probably the ultimate reason that habits are so important. It's true, like habits can help you earn more money or be more productive or lose weight. Um, And all that stuff is great. But in addition to the external results that habits provide, they also shape your sense of self. They like are the, the engine or the avenue through which you learn to believe things about yourself. Like sometimes people will say stuff like, fake it till you make it. But fake it till you make it is asking yourself to believe something without evidence for it. And you can do that for a little while, you could do it for a day or a week, but eventually, I mean, there's a word for beliefs that don't have evidence behind them, it's delusion, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're deluding yourself, then eventually you give up on that. But the power of doing a better habit each day or casting a little vote for that type of person is that now you have evidence to root your belief in. Yeah, and so now I've done it for six up, months, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, now you have a lot of evidence that you're a podcaster or right. a good interviewer. You know, like you do this over and over again. Each time you cast a vote for believing that about yourself. And you don't just, you aren't delusionally believing that you're a good interviewer. It's because you've shown up and done it hundreds of times. Right. Um, and so I think that that's true for any habit, large or small that they provide evidence of the desired identity or the the type of person that you are. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific 
plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. How do you remove ambiguity from your world to keep that clarity of intention and purpose behind what you do? I don't know that I have a good answer to how to live a life with clarity, but some of the things that I try to do include not doing too many things. So if you're optimizing for too many things at once, it's very hard to remain clear. You just have too many, you got too many, um, you know, irons in the fire. There's too much going on. Um, and so that is easy to do when you're choosing between a good use of time and a bad use of time. It becomes harder to do, and I think this it becomes increasingly true as you get deeper and deeper into your career. It becomes harder to do when you're choosing between good uses of time and great uses of time. Um, in a sense, the most dangerous things on your to-do list, the things that are most likely to remove clarity and cause confusion and introduce a sense of overwhelm are items like three through five on your priority list because you have a good story for why you're doing those things. That's why they're on the list to begin with. And smart people are so good at coming up with like valid excuses or developing stories that sound really uh, reasonable. So you'll look at that list and you'll be like, oh, well, I, I need to do this. Like, this is number three. You know, like, I, I have it on the list for a reason. This is a good way to spend time. I'll be productive. But the truth is, items three through five are actually the greatest distraction to doing items one and two because you can convince yourself that you're being productive while still avoiding the highest leverage work. So not taking on too many projects, I think, is uh, a really crucial part of it. Obviously, there's sort of a connecting point there, like a pre-step, which is you need to know what you're optimizing for. You need to know what what is the most important thing. And that requires a little bit of self-reflection. If you take a bad habit or an unhealthy habit, like uh, eating a donut or something, um, the immediate outcome is favorable. It's sugary, it's tasty, it's enjoyable in the moment. That's how it serves you. That's the reason why you repeat it. The ultimate outcome, if you repeat that every day for the next three months or year or whatever, is you end up gaining weight or you're less healthy or so on. For good habits, it's often the reverse, right? Like sometimes, uh, you know, the benefit of going to the gym in many people's eyes is the immediate outcome is unfavorable. Sweat, I have to work, it's effortful, it's hard, and sacrifice. I don't get to watch TV, I got to go there instead. Um, so the immediate outcome is unfavorable. The ultimate outcome, if you repeat that habit for two months or a year or whatever, is you're fit and healthy. And this is one of the key challenges of building good habits and breaking bad ones is figuring out ways to take the long-term consequences of your good habits or of your bad habits and pull them into the present moment. So you feel a little bit of the pain right now. So it serves you less and to take the long-term rewards of your good habits and pull those into the present moment. So it feels good. And this is one reason why, you know, it's great to choose like, what's the best form of exercise? Well, maybe it's the best, the one that you enjoy because if it feels good in the moment, mm -hmm. now it serves you and you have a reason to repeat it. Your brain is always developing habits. So it's, it's happening whether you want it to happen or not. And the question is, can you take control of the process? And uh, in a lot of ways, the fact that we have these mindless automatic behaviors, it's a pretty good system that evolution has designed. I mean, if you think about it from a very high level, you're, through, as you go throughout life, you are facing problems. And some of those problems are big problems, and some of them are really small ones, like you need to tie your shoe. And your brain, whenever you come across a solution to the problem that you're facing and you repeat it again and again, your brain starts to automate that. So, you know, you tie your shoe once and it, the first time it takes some effort and then, and so on, but then you do it 50 or hundred or 200 times. And pretty soon you can tie your shoes while having a conversation or thinking about something else or whatever. And this is sort of the role that habits play in our lives is that they are these mental shortcuts, these kind of automatic scripts that you can just play whenever the situation or the context is right. And they free up cognitive resources to focus your attention elsewhere. And so that's a really good system uh, overall. It's, it, we use it all day long without thinking about it. But occasionally it can serve us poorly because, you know, so let's, uh, let's say you come home from work and you feel stressed and exhausted. And that's a problem that needs to have some kind of solution. So for one person, maybe they learn that uh, if I play video games for an hour, I'm no longer stressed and exhausted. 
For another person, maybe learn if I smoke a cigarette, I reduce stress. For a third person, maybe it's meditating for 10 minutes. For a fourth person, maybe they run for a half hour. And the point here is that different solutions can cause, can solve the same recurring problems throughout life. And so your original habit is not necessarily the optimal habit for solving whatever the situations are that you come across in your life, the problems that you face day in and day out. And so if you can, it becomes more about designing a better solution uh, to those to those problems. And that's really, that's where my focus is. It's like, all right, we're building habits anyway. How can we develop better solutions to the recurring problems in our life? You can find examples of people who flip a switch and transform their lives or have an epiphany and do it overnight. That's but I really think hard. that it's rare. Yeah. Um, I think that the more sustainable strategy, the more reliable strategy is to scale it down to the first two minutes, focus on that, establish it, master the art of showing up, and mm -hmm. then go from there. So really you should like, usually when people think about building better habits, they optimize for the finish line, right? It's like, how much weight do I need to lose? How much money do I need to make? Um, you know, how, when can I finish this book? It's all focused on the result. But I think instead, if you optimize for the starting line, make it as easy as possible to start, scale it down, uh, organize your environment so that all that stuff is set up. This is another strategy for making it easy, which is that you can prime your environment to make the future action easier, right? Like if you chop up a bunch of vegetables and fruit on Sunday, it's now easier to have a healthy snack during the week. If you set your workout clothes out the night before, it's now easier to get into the workout the next day. But doing all that stuff to make it easy to show up, that is probably the more important piece early on. The process of change usually starts with self-awareness. Um, now you can change without being aware of it, but you're not usually in control. Um, it means that the environment shifted or the circumstance or situation changed and you changed in response, but you weren't really influencing it in any meaningful way. So it starts with self-awareness. Then the next step, which you already mentioned, is kind of, we could call it different things, call it deliberate practice, call it routine or you know whatever, but you're consciously doing the behavior. So you're putting an effort to practice it. Is there, just to stop you there, is there any tricks you know, that you have found as far as that part of it, you know, because people don't get started, they yeah. have too high of goals. I've heard a ton of different ones, but sure. could you share with us, you know, some tips on that part of it? So I think there are a couple, maybe two, let's pick two strategies that you could use right away. So the first one is a lot of people feel like they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. Um, and what I mean by that is they think I need more willpower, I need more motivation, I need more persistence, I need more drive. And certainly, those are all important qualities in life, but the truth is they, uh, we often make statements about how we wanna change in very vague ways. We say something like, this time it'll be different, I'll just eat better, I'm gonna try harder, uh, whatever. And instead, if we have clarity, and you could use, uh, there are two strategies in the book that I talk about for this. One is implementation intentions. So it is a intention to implement a particular behavior. So the simplest way to do this is you fill out a sentence that says exactly when and where the behavior will occur. So I will go to the gym on Monday at 5 p.m. at this address, or I will journal at this coffee shop at you know 6 a.m., blah, blah, blah. And the more clear that plan is, the more likely you are to follow through. And there's a bunch of research studies that show that. People are more likely to get their flu shot, quit smoking, recycle, exercise, basically any kind of habit you can think of. I divide a habit into four different stages. Um, and so just from a high level, those stages are cue, craving, response, and reward. So the cue is something that gets your attention, like you see a plate of cookies on the counter that's a visual cue, or the ambulance comes behind you on the street and you hear it and so you pull to the side of the road, like that's an auditory cue, or your phone buzzes in your pocket, that's like a physical or a tactile cue. Um, and so it can be any of the, the senses, but uh, usually it tends to be visual. Humans are very visual creatures, so that, uh, that tends to be the most predominant sense. But the cue gets your attention. The second step is the craving, which is dependent on how you interpret the cue. So it, uh, you, whether you get a craving or the motivation to act, uh, whether you predict that it would be useful to take a response, depends on the meaning that you assign to the cue. So if you have two people who walk into a living room and they see a pack of cigarettes sitting on the table, the first person might, uh, they've been a smoker for 10 years and they see it and they get this craving of, oh, I wanna pick a cigarette up and smoke. So they interpret that visual cue as favorable. The second person has never smoked a day in their life and so they see the cigarettes and they just think, oh, it's just a pack of cigarettes and they move on. Um, and so it's really about the meaning that you assign to that visual cue that determines whether you act on it or not. 
Then there's the response. And finally, there would, the response is the actual habit or action itself. And then finally, there's the reward or the outcome. So visual cue, you see a plate of cookies on the counter. Craving, you interpret them as favorable. You predict, oh, that'll be sweet, sugary, tasty. So you response, grab one, take a bite. And then finally, the reward. And the reward serves two purposes. The first is it satisfies the craving that came before the action. So you predicted that the ta- the cookie would be tasty and sweet. And once you take a bite, it is, in fact, sugary, tasty, sweet. So that re- resolves that craving. And then the second thing that it does is it teaches your brain what to repeat for next time. Because when actions are followed by a feeling of pleasure, when it's enjoyable or you got Uh, you solve the problem you were facing or you had some kind of successful feeling at the end of the habit, it feels good. And your brain's like, hey, that was enjoyable. I should do this again next time when I'm in a similar circumstance. And so it's actually uh, closing the feedback loop and training your brain what to do again and again. And once you've done something enough times and gotten the outcome that you hoped uh, from it uh, again and again and again, the feedback loop gets really tight and you can do it pretty much on autopilot. You don't even really think about it. You're just sort of automatically whenever you put a shoe on and see a shoe untied on your foot, that's the cue. And you know, Oh, I just go ahead and tie the shoe. And that's how I get this um, uh, reward that I'm looking for of having a shoe securely on my foot and so on. If you want to break a bad habit, there are kind of three potential paths you could take. So the first is you can eliminate it entirely. So elimination. Second option is you can reduce it. So you could like curtail it to the desired degree. I don't want to never drink caffeine. I just want to drink less of it. And the third option is you could substitute it. You could replace it with a different habit. And of those three, oftentimes replacing it is actually the more effective option. So for example, if you get your caffeine from drinking Coke or soda or something like that, then maybe you find out, hey, you know, something I really love from this experience is I actually just like drinking a carbonated beverage. And so it's the carbonation that I like. And maybe if I substitute it with sparkling water or something like that, I still get the carbonation sensation, but I don't have the caffeine associated with it anymore. And so that's a way of substituting for that behavior. And you still get something that the experience provides. This is actually kind of an important just like larger picture, big picture thing about habits, which is every habit that you have, we build habits to solve the repeated problems that we face in life. And I'm using problems in a very general sense here. You know, like let's say that you come home from work and you feel tired and exhausted from a long day. Well, in a sense, coming home from work at 6 PM and feeling tired is a problem. And especially if you experience it repeatedly, you got to come up with some kind of solution for that. And generally speaking, we just kind of like try things out in life. And so you can imagine one person solves the problem of feeling exhausted by scrolling Instagram mindlessly for 30 minutes. And another person solves that problem by playing video games for an hour. And a third person solves it by going for a run for, you know, 20 minutes. And those are all solutions to the same kind of underlying problem But some of them are more healthy or more productive or service better than others. And what do you think the odds are that the solutions you've come up with to the repeated problems in your life are the optimal one? Like, it's just so unlikely that whatever you happen to have stumbled into throughout life is the perfect way or the best habit that serves you most. So I think what I'm trying to get out there is. Maybe take a little bit of the pressure off yourself and don't worry about judging yourself so much. You're just trying to solve the repeated problems that you face. But once you realize that it's unlikely that your current solutions are the optimal solutions, well, now maybe we can step outside and above ourselves and look down and try to come up with a better solution. So rather than drinking a Coke to get the carbonation, we can drink sparkling water. So that's one example for the substitution. If we want to take the other path of reduction, Something I've noticed about myself is uh, if I get a six pack of beer and I put it in the the front of the fridge, like in the door or on a shelf that's like right at eye level, I'll drink one every night just because it's there. But if I take it and put it on the lowest shelf in the fridge and like it's kind of all the way back in the corner, I can't really see it unless I'm bending down. It'll sit there for two weeks or three weeks. Like, and so I'm like, did I want it or not? You know, like (laughs) if it was obvious, then I grab one. But if it wasn't, then I avoid it. And I think that's a simple question to ask yourself. Where do I get my caffeine? Is it coffee? Is it soda? And is that really obvious? Is it like 
the coffee sitting right out on the counter is the, the soda, like the first thing I see at eye level when I open the fridge and how can I make it less obvious in atomic habits? There are kind of what I call the four laws of behavior change. And it's just this big picture view of how to build a good habit. And so if you want to build a good habit, you want to make your habits obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. And if you want to break a bad habit, you just do the opposite of those four. So you want to make it invisible, make it unattractive, make it difficult and make it unsatisfying. Can you give me a, a practical application of that? If we just walk through I, uh, any habit, doesn't matter. I want to establish. Can you give me a practical application of that, a, str- tr- a strategic application of how I would do it? Sure. So once we have those four stages, I like to try to operationalize it. How do we make this actionable? How do we apply it to a habit like you're asking? And to do that, I've come up with what I call the four laws of behavior change. And so there's one law for each stage. And if you follow these, they give you kind of like a high level framework for building a good habit or breaking a bad one. So from a real quick, again, from a high level, the four laws are the first law is to make it obvious. You want the cues of your good habits to be obvious, available, visible, easy to see. Easier it is for it to get your attention, the more likely you are to act on it. Second law is to make it attractive. So again, this one connects to the craving, right? The more attractive or appealing or exciting or enticing a habit is, the more likely you are to perform it. The third law is to make it easy. The easier, more convenient, frictionless, simple a habit is, the more likely you are to do it. We've already talked a little bit about that. The two-minute rule is an example of making it easy. And then the fourth law is to make it satisfying. The more satisfying or enjoyable or rewarding or pleasurable a habit is, the more likely you are to repeat it. So those four laws make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. They give you a high level framework for building a habit. If you're ever not sure what to do, if you say, how, how can I make this more habitual or how can I you know, do a better job of doing this consistently? You can just go through those four and ask yourself, how can I make it obvious? How can I make it more attractive? How can I make it easier? How can I make it more satisfying? And you'll start to find opportunities to do those things. And of course, the whole book is organized around sharing different strategies for doing that. Let me just give you a couple of personal examples so you can see how this might be applied. When the pandemic started, I knew that I was going to want to start. I was just, I wasn't going to have to be driving or traveling as much. So I wanted to spend that time, some of that time I was spending traveling previously that I wanted to use it productively and read more. Mm -hmm. So I uh, opened up my phone and I downloaded Audible for audiobooks and I moved the app to the first screen on my phone. I moved all the other apps to the second screen. So the only thing I saw when I opened my phone up was Audible. Now, that's a very small thing, does not radically transform your behavior, but it was a way of making reading more obvious, right? So that's mm-hmm. the first law, making it obvious. Let me get it in front of me. I also sprinkled books kind of around the house or on my desk. Like I've got, I have three on my desk right now. I have a couple, you know, by the bed. I've got a couple in the living room. And the point for me was I never wanted to be far from a good idea. You know, like I always wanted to be kind of surrounded by something that was interesting or useful to read. And odds are, it's more likely that I pick it up and take a look at it. On the flip side, this also applies this first law of making it obvious. It also applies to many of the bad habits that we have. So, for example, uh, a lot of people feel like they watch too much television. But walk into any living room. Where do all the couches and chairs face? You know, it's like, what is this room designed to get you to do? And so... I think the question that you can ask yourself for this first law and making your habits obvious is what does this space encourage, right? What behavior is encouraged in this area? And you want to design your life, design the spaces that you live and work in to encourage the good habits and discourage the bad ones to make the the path of least resistance or the obvious choice, the good habit. So the healthy food is on the counter, not the junk food books are around you, not the TV remote and so on and so forth. And No individual choice like that is going to radically transform things, but you can see how making a dozen or two dozen or 50 little tweaks like that, now all of a sudden you're living in a space that always is kind of like nudging you toward the more productive behavior. What are some of the common reasons why we struggle with decision making? All kinds of things that can influence it. You know, there's all sorts of biases that we have, like confirmation bias, for example, is probably like the one of the most predominant ones where you're just sort of searching for evidence that um, supports what you already want to do rather than trying to find the truth or figure out the best way to do it. I think one mindset that's good to counter that is telling yourself, I don't care about being right, I care about getting it right. 
You know, like I don't need to be the one who comes up with the correct idea as long as we get it correct in the long run. And maybe that gives you a chance to check your ego a little bit and search a little more widely for a solution rather than just hoping that you'll feel good about the process. So, you know, being wrong, nobody likes being wrong. Like being wrong is not going to feel good. But if you're wrong in service of getting it right in the long run, then, you know, who cares? That's fine. Um, so I think there, there are all kinds of biases like that. But generally, when I think about decision making and trying to make better choices, what does it mean to make a good choice? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you get the result that you want. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're always right. I think what it means is that you are continually improving your position. So a good choice is one that puts you in a better position for the next cycle, the next round, the, you know, the uncertain future. There's this professor at the University of Florida. He's retired now. He was a photography professor. His name's Jerry Ullsman. And uh, at the beginning of the semester, he would have this film photography class, and he'd bring the class in, and he would split them into two groups. And he said, everybody on this side of the room, you're going to be graded on the quantity of work that you do this uh, semester. And everybody on this side of the room, you're going to be graded on the quality of work that you do this semester. And he further explained it by saying that for your film photography, you're going to be responsible for having 100 pictures. If you do 100 photos over the course of the semester, that'll be an A. If you do 90, it'll be a B. If you do 80, it'll be a C, and so on. So it's quantity. For this group, you only have to produce one photo, but it has to be the most perfect photo that you can make, the best photo that you can make. An interesting, an interesting thing happened. At the end of the term, all the best grades came from the quantity group, not from the quality group. And what ended up happening was that while people were busy experimenting, making mistakes, learning how to you know, play with composition and so on, they would come across a really great photo. And while the quality group was busy theorizing about what perfection would look like and how to take the perfect photo and not actually honing their skills, they ended up only making something mediocre or average. And the important insight here, especially for habits, is that in the beginning, the most important thing is just to shut up and put your reps in. Just make sure that you hone the skill, right? And you can start to think of it, the way that I like to think of it is that any outcome that you wish to achieve is just a point along the spectrum of repetitions. So if you have few reps to more reps, and you can imagine an easy goal, moderate goal, a hard goal, the more reps that you put in, the more that you, more likely you, you are to achieve that goal. So maybe point A is, you know, let's take fitness, squatting 100 pounds, point B is squatting 200, point C is squatting 300. Maybe you need to put in 100 reps or 1,000 reps to get to point A. Maybe it's 5,000 to get to point B. Maybe it's 10,000 to get to point C. The frameworks and principles in Atomic Habits, are there any sections, chapters, principles, anything that you wish more people paid attention to? Right? There's something that you put in that gets glossed over or maybe mm. doesn't stick for whatever reason, as much as other things, but you think it or these things are important. Well, sometimes you might just be like, maybe I thought that idea was better than it actually was, you know? <laughs> there might be that too. There might be that. Yeah, I, I have a couple. So there are two things that came to mind. The first one is there's a little example I give in the book about maybe about halfway through or 40% through where I talk about having a pregame routine and kind of doing things in the same sequence each time, in the same order each time. And that helps get you in the mindset and kind of initiate the habit. So I, you know, I played baseball through college and I have the same pregame routine that I did before each game. And that kind of like flips the switch in your mind where it's like, hey, like it's time to compete now, you know, like it's game mode. Or the example I gave in the book was this guy who he would do his writing at the library and he would go to the library, sit at the same desk each day and put on his headphones and play the same playlist. And that that little sequence was a pregame routine that got him in the mindset to do his writing habit. And one day he turned around and realized that no music was playing. He just had his headphones on and it was just, it was just silent, but he was writing and he was like 20 minutes into writing before he realized it. And it's a good example of how like just that sequence of doing it the same way each time and having that same pregame routine, that little ritual got him in the mindset. He didn't even need to press play that day. He was just ready to write. And so if you can come up with what that little pregame ritual is for you, that can be a great way to initiate a habit. And I don't usually see people talk about that. I think actually I've heard some examples like this on, on your podcast previously, Tim. Like I think when you talked to Josh Waitzkin at one point, he at some some time he gave this example, maybe it was in his books, maybe it was a conversation with you, where he was competing in this national competition, martial arts, and he was told that he was going to compete at one time 
and they came up to him and he was like sleeping or laying on a, on a bench. And they were like, Hey, sorry, the timing was wrong. You're actually up in like six minutes. And he was like, normally I would have been thrown off, but he had this little pregame ritual that he did. And he tried to, as he developed it over time, it started out and maybe it was 10 minutes and then he tried to compress it. So it was seven minutes and then it was three minutes and then eventually got it down to where his little ritual was just something he did for like 30 seconds. So they woke him up on that bench and he's got to compete six minutes later, but all he needed was 30 seconds to kind of like get in the right frame of mind. And he was like, okay, now I'm ready to go. And so those pregame rituals can be really powerful if you make it your own and come up with something that like you do every time and it helps get you into the mindset to compete or to perform. One of the things we often talk about on the podcast is we all like, we embrace failure. Failure is where the learning happens, but it's about getting smart quickly as well. Would you tell us a little bit more about that philosophy and why it's so important? Sure. Well, first, a little, just a little point on your uh, thought about embracing failure. Um, I, I feel like this is something you hear from a lot of people who talk about, you know, especially like Silicon Valley startup culture, you know, failure is almost praised, like, you know, things like that. And it, there is an element of truth to it. Uh, I don't think that you should be scared of failing because then that prevents you from reaching, that prevents you from trying. But I also think there's kind of an opposite uh, side or n another side of the coin that's important to emphasize, which is you're never trying to fail. Like that's not the objective, you know, just because it's not like we're okay with it in the sense that, oh, it's fine. Like I didn't get the result I wanted that let's just stick with that. You know, like yeah. I'm, I am in fact trying to do my best every time I am in fact trying to figure out a solution that works. I am in fact trying to get an exceptional result. Failure is never the objective. Um, but I'm not scared of it. You know, like it's not going to prevent me from trying. Yeah. And in fact, I would say that actually Many people, their fear of failure or their fear, fear of how they'll be judged or what other people might think or whether it will appear impressive enough for, you know, what they're hoping to, to um, instill on the people around them. That general fear, that worry, whatever form it takes, it ends up becoming like a break and it, it like stops the car. It prevents you from moving forward. And my encouragement is to say, listen, let fear be the gas pedal, not the brake. And so in, I have all those same fears, you know, like I'm worried about what the people who know me well will think of the next project I'm going to create. I, when I started writing, um, I, I still, this is even to this day, I still have never shared an article that I wrote on my personal Facebook page with like all the people who knew me from high school or college or things like that. Um, and why is that? Well, now at this point it's because who cares and I don't use Facebook anymore. But, um, in the beginning, it was because I was worried about what they would think. I was worried that they would look at it and be like, Oh, you know, look at this dumb little blog this guy has. Um, and instead of so letting that sense that, of belonging was powerful uh, then. Oh, for sure. Sorry, I mean, just it's, power, it's powerful. To... Yeah, it's powerful for all of us. You know, I mean, we all want to belong. Yeah. That's one of the deepest needs that we all have. This is why those trade-offs are hard to manage because yeah. we all do want to fit in. We all want to connect. And also sometimes people will say things like, well, don't, don't care what other people think of you. It can be useful in a context, but there's a very good reason why we care about what other people think of us, which is it tends to serve you very well when people think well of you. It's very beneficial to have friends, to have support. Not only does it feel good, it also provides you opportunities. It provides you love and affection. It provides you support in your life that you need. So to care what other people think about you is like perhaps the most natural thing in the world to do. The question is not whether to care. It's just when to care. Um, so anyway, all of that to say, um, rather than letting my worries about what other people think of me prevent me from writing or prevent me from creating. Instead, I just used it as fuel to say, okay, listen, you just need to get to work now. You know, like you, you need to put even more effort into this so that you can make it truly great. So you can create something that you're proud of. And if you use it as the gas pedal and not the brake, then it becomes a driver of creative output rather than a hindrance for it. Talk about that a little bit. Like you want to be more productive. You, this article, by the way, I, guys, Google it. It's so good. It actually teaches you how to say no as well in the article. But are you good at this or did you write it for your own benefit? 
Well, pretty much everything I write is a reminder to myself of what I should be doing. So uh, no, it's not that I'm great at it. It's that I'm trying to learn to be better at it. I felt this very acutely after Atomic Habits came out. And over the course of the next... The first like three months that it was out, I was doing okay. And then the book really started to take off. And I was constantly feeling like I'm a very slow learner and that I should have been upgrading the level at which I was saying no to things. And I was always like two or three months behind. I was always on the hook for more stuff than I should have been. And it was because I was saying yes to too many things. And there's this weird dynamic where success starts to eat itself. So the, the thing that was getting me all of these opportunities is because I was focused and I wrote a good book. And because of that, People were very interested in talking to me or sharing these new ideas. And like, there's all, there's all these interesting new opportunities that come your way. You know, do you want to speak at this thing? Or what about these TV rights? Or how about this interesting opportunity? Or would you like to come to this, you know, cool conference or retreat or whatever? And individually, each of them sounds really fun and interesting. But collectively, if you start to say yes to all those things, you don't have any more time to do the thing that got you those opportunities in the first place, which is thinking clearly and writing a good book. And so uh, success like eats itself. All these new opportunities come in and they squeeze out the thing that you were good at in the first place. So it's a, I don't know. The other thing that's difficult about it, and I still, you know, I'm close enough to the beginning of my career that I can still appreciate this and feel this. For the first decade of my career, I was trying to say yes to everything. I was trying to capitalize on every opportunity so that I would have the chance now to say no to basically everything because you got a bunch of stuff coming your way. So at first, it's like outbound and you're trying to like capitalize on every opportunity you can. And then there's this like rapid switch where now all of a sudden everything's inbound and you have to put up a tight filter. And uh, that can be a difficult lesson to learn. Occasionally, and this is true for everybody. If you live long enough, life will come for you at some point, right? Like something's going to happen. Um, so occasionally life will stress you. But when life doesn't challenge you, I think it's important to challenge yourself because otherwise you're just living in this optimal environment, air conditioning, and you know everything else is super easy. You can get all the information in the world at your fingertips. You never have to like, if you think about how crazy just eating is in the modern world. So previously, when we lived in tribes, you you had to expend energy to get calories. Um, at a minimum, you were foraging for berries, but otherwise you probably had to like run something down and kill it or part of a group hunt or all kinds of other things. Now you can get calories without expending any. All you have to do is just tap like Uber Eats on your phone or something. It'll show up at your door um, and you can just sit on the couch, which is of course like a recipe for uh, poor health, but also just it's the game has completely changed now. We've transcended a lot of our evolutionary programming and natural um, situations. And so you need to be careful about designing that to serve you rather than to work against you because it can very easily nudge you in the other direction. I think there are a few core habits that are going to serve everybody and certainly serve me well. So exercise is a huge one. Um, I don't do it daily, but I exercise, I train four times a week. Yeah. And I feel like if I didn't exercise, I don't know that I would be an entrepreneur. Like, I don't know if I could handle the psychological roller coaster without the physical outlet. Yeah, the release, the... You probably feel that as yeah. like an athlete too, you know, like gotcha. I, for uh, being an athlete for so many years, I feel like I need to push myself physically in addition to mentally. Absolutely. If it's just mental, <clears throat> it doesn't do it for me. I, I no. need to have a physical outlet. So exercise. Exercise is one. The other, the ultimate meta habit is reading. Because if you build a habit of reading, you can solve pretty much any other problem. You know, you hmm. want to learn how to be a better podcaster? You can read about that. You want to right. learn how to meditate? You can read about that. You want to learn how to make more money? You can read about that. Um, and so what you need is to develop a habit of reading and then whatever problem you're facing at the time, you can, you have a method for solving that. One of my favorite studies is about exercise and they had three cohorts in this study. So they have first cohort, they said, I just want you to track how often you work out over the next few weeks, right? So that's the, the, um, standard cohort, the control group. Second group is that we want you to track how often you exercise. We're also going to give you a motivation, motivational speech, presentation, talk about the benefits of heart health, why habits are good for you, and so on. So this is the motivated group, right? The third group, they got the same presentation, so they're equally motivated, and then they did one thing differently. And that one thing was they filled out this sentence. They said, during the next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on this day, in this at this time, in this place, right? They specifically stated their intention to implement the behavior. So implementation intention. Here's what happened. 
First group, one out of three of them worked out. Second group, motivation did nothing. As soon as they left the researcher's facility the next day, they weren't motivated. It's like reading a book or watching a YouTube or listening to a motivational speaker and then you forget all about it 20 minutes later. Um, but the third group, the group that had a specific plan for how they were gonna implement the behavior, nine out of 10 of them worked out. So you can increase your odds of success two to three X just by having a specific plan. And this is the insight. Many people think that they lack motivation when what they really lack is clarity. They think that they need to get more motivated, that they need willpower in order to execute on a habit. If I just felt like writing, if I just felt like meditating, if I felt like working out, then I would do it. But in fact, they don't have a plan for it, and so they wake up each day thinking, I wonder if I'll feel motivated to write today. I wonder if I'll feel motivated to work out today. But instead, you can take the decision-making out of it by explicitly stating when, where, and how you want to implement the habit. It sounds easy to say, let's just start a plan, let's you know, write down exactly what you should do, and then maybe you'll follow through on it. But of course, we all know that there are challenges that arise, it's not quite that easy. So here's a little strategy that I like to use to make sure you can come up with a better plan of action, and it's called a failure pre-mortem. So the way that it works is you think about the habit, the project, the goal, whatever the most important thing is that you wanna work on, and then I want you to imagine, fast forward six months from now, and you failed and then tell the story of why you failed. What happened, what challenges did you encounter, what was it that took you off course? Um, when I do this with businesses, sometimes we call it the kill the company exercise, because everybody just sits around and thinks about ways to kill the company in the next six months. And uh, once you have all that stuff laid out on the table in front of you, you can start to make better choices about how to develop a plan. You can start to have if-then plans, so not only do I want to exercise for 20 minutes on Monday at 5 p.m., but also if I do not exercise because I have to take my kid to practice or whatever, then Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. I will go in, right? You can have ways to adjust for these challenges. I think we actually have like three options for breaking bad habits. So the first option is to reduce exposure. Um, so something like, you know, if you want to stop spending so much money on electronics, then don't follow all the latest tech review blogs, you know, like you're, or if you want to lose weight, don't follow a bunch of food bloggers on Instagram. Um, you're constantly being triggered by that and having to like overcome the prompts. Now that doesn't always work, but if you can cut a habit off at the source, then a lot of the time, like the craving won't arise, uh, naturally. So in atomic habits in the book, I talk a little bit about this woman who she smoked while she was in college and she would always smoke while riding horses with a friend. And so eventually at some point she quit smoking uh, and she's also stopped, you know, like seeing that friend and graduated from college and so on, wasn't riding horses. And then like 10 years later, she got back on a horse for the first time and suddenly craved a cigarette. And um, she was like, what is going on here? And it's your habits are often tied to a context. They're tied to a situation or some kind of cue. And so if you can reduce exposure to that cue, then in many cases, the craving won't arise. So that's the first option for breaking a bad habit. The second option, which kind of sucks, but is like to sit with the craving long enough to like let this wave of desire ride itself out. And so you basically just resist temptation. Um, it's possible. It's easier if um, if your hand is forced. If you use what I call a commitment device. So, brief story, real quick. Victor Hugo, um, famous author who wrote like Hunchback of Notre Dame and a bunch of other things. Well. When he got the book deal for Hunchback of Notre Dame, he just procrastinated for like a year. He hosts a bunch of house parties, has friends over. He went traveling for a little while. He was he, yeah, he, he <laughs> like he got the book deal. He did nothing, no work. Um, and uh, eventually, his publisher got pissed off. They were like, you know, can you please like actually work on this? And so they set this ultimatum for him, and they said, uh, we're gonna we're gonna cancel the book in six months if you don't have it done by then. And so he. Um, he got his assistant to come in, put all his clothes into a chest and they locked him up and took him out of the house. And the only thing he was left with was like this, this shawl, this like large robe. So basically he had no clothes that were suitable for hosting guests or for leaving the house or like going on trips or anything else. So he more or less put himself on house arrest. Um, and what ended up happening was each time procrastination arose, he was able to kind of sit with that feeling and let it ride because he didn't really have many other options and then get back to work on the book. And it ended up working. He got the book done like two weeks early. But things like that where you can lock in your future action and it, it becomes really hard to go to your friend's party or go out to you know travel to a different place or whatever um, just because you don't have the option. If you can increase the friction, then sometimes you can sit with the craving of a bad habit and let it ride out. So that's your second choice. And then the third choice is the one that you just mentioned, which is you take the solution that the bad habit is providing, the way that it's serving you, and you find a new behavior that delivers that same outcome. 
What makes you an expert on habits? Oh man, based I'm, on <laughs> lots of other people that are talking about habits. I think that, and I've said this many times before. I'm just going through this with everybody else. Uh, I consider my readers my peers uh, in the sense that we're all just trying things out. The only difference is I write about what I learn and share it each week, mm-hmm. and, but we're all just learning along the way. Um, early on, I had a feeling like that. I was like, "Who am I to? You know, I'm just a guy. Who am I yeah. to write about this?" And I had a friend tell me the way you develop expertise is by writing about it every week. So I wrote a, a new article about habits every Monday and Thursday for three years. And that was how I developed the expertise on the topic, was you, by yeah. writing about it. You did research, research. Right. and you said, here's what I found, here's what I tried, here's what worked, what didn't work. It's a combination of me reading the scientific literature and reading the research and then trying to distill the practical insights from that and testing things out in my own life as a weightlifter, a travel photographer, a writer, an entrepreneur, and seeing what that looks like, and then the two together. And I think you need both. Like, I don't want to be some new age version of an academic who's in an ivory tower just like theorizing about ideas is different what it looks like to put ideas into practice, mm-hmm. right? Like imagine you're a peak performance coach and you show up to coach like an NBA team. These guys are like, dude, you need to step on the court if you know what, right, to see what it's actually like. In a sense, you could say that every behavior is driven by the desire for a change in state. And so when you um, smoke a cigarette or eat a bag of Doritos or pick up your phone, what you really want is not the nicotine or the calories from the Doritos or the um, the likes on social media. What you want is to feel less anxious or to feel approved or to um, not be bored anymore. So it's really the desire to change that state that you're in mm-hmm. that motivates you to act and the behavior. And in many cases, a lot of our modern technology is an example of this. You didn't. It, we didn't evolve. You didn't come out of the womb with like a desire to check Instagram, right? Like right. It, there's nothing evolutionarily wired there. It's just a modern manifestation of an ancient desire to gain respect and approval or to not be abandoned by the tribe or to feel approved in, you know, in some capacity. And right. uh, so we kind of have those like deeper primal drives. And then the secondary layer on top of it is just the modern manifestation of that behavior and how we're resolving it in the moment. The first stage of every habit is a cue. The second stage is a craving or some kind of prediction that your brain makes. I'll give you an example of these in a second. The third stage is the response. And then the fourth stage is the reward. So mm-hmm. you walk into a, um, the question I had that, that no model I could find could solve in, in any good way or explain in any good way was why can the same person respond to the same cue in a different way? So let's say you get into the habit of going to the gym at five o'clock every day, but then sometimes work gets busy and you don't go to the gym at five o'clock. Current models don't explain that very well because it's like, well, the queue is five. You should be going to the gym right now. It says you, the routine falls automatically after the queue. Um, or why, uh, why does someone walk into the kitchen and see a plate of cookies and then they automatically want to eat it? But you could just as imagine, uh, just as easily imagine that you just got done eating dinner in the other room and you're stuffed and you're full and you walk in and you see a plate of cookies and you're like, I'm stuffed, I don't want to eat anything. So what's going on there? Mm. And I think these four stages explain it, which is you see the cue or you experience a cue and then your craving or your prediction differs based on your current state. So the way that you interpret the cues in your life is contingent upon the current state that you're in. The way you're feeling. Right. Um, and also other things like your beliefs mm. or your identity, the social group that you're part of, right? So like if you're in a different group, then maybe you interpret things in a different way. Um, you know, you can imagine one group, they practice a particular religion, they walk into a butcher shop and see pork and they don't, they're like, oh, we can't eat that. Right. Another person walks in and they're like, oh yeah, I'll have a pork sandwich because it's obvious and easy and right there. Um, so what you choose is contingent upon how you interpret the cues in your life. You don't have to be the victim of your environment, you can also be the architect of it. You can decide to design something to make your good behaviors easier and your bad behaviors harder. So when it comes to habits, if you want to practice your guitar more frequently, put it right in the middle of your living room so you run across all the time. If you want to read more, when you make your bed in the morning, take the book you want to read, put it on top of the pillow. When you come back that night, pick it up, read a few pages, go to sleep. For me, I, uh, I used to buy apples all the time, and then I would put them in the crisper at the bottom of the fridge, and they would sit there for three weeks and go bad, and I'd finally open it up and see them again and get mad, and then eventually, I bought a bowl and put it right in the middle of the counter. And so then when I buy apples, I put them there, I see them every day, and now I eat them all the time. Um, Many of our desires are simply shaped because we have an environment that shapes us in that way. 
So the moral of the story is I've never seen someone stick to positive habits in a consistent fashion in a negative environment. Maybe you can overpower it once or twice, maybe you can have the willpower to do the right thing on one day, but if you're constantly fighting against those forces, it's gonna be very hard to follow through. People have heard things like this before, start small, small steps, whatever, but even when you know you should start small, it's still really easy to start too big. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, say you wanna get in shape and you're like, all right, I wanna run a couple days a week, but I know I should start small, so I'll only run for 15 minutes. But even that is like way bigger than what I'm talking about. I mean, it should be so small that you, in the book I call it the two minute rule, but you should downscale any habit to fit within two minutes. Mm. So it's like, all right, I wanna go for a run three days a week. My habit is I put on my running shoes and I step out the door. Anything else that happens after that is just bonus. It's a success. Now, yeah. sometimes people resist that because they're like, well, this sounds kind of like a mental trick, right? Like I know the real goal isn't just to put my shoes on, I know the real goal is to go for a run. So if you feel that way, my suggestion would be only do the first two minutes for the first few weeks. Because what you need to do is master the art of showing up. Like I had a, I had a reader who ended up losing over 100 pounds. And one of the things that he did was he went to the gym, but he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he would show up, be there, do like half an exercise, five minutes would go, he'd leave. He did this for like six weeks. Wow. Now, it sounds ridiculous, it sounds silly, because it's, it's like, the opposite. Just work out for a half hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But what he was doing was mastering the art of showing up. And a habit must be established before it can be improved, right? If you don't establish the habit, there's nothing to optimize. If you're not showing up at the gym every day, you don't even, who cares about what workout you're doing? You're not even there. Don't start running an hour a day if you've never run in a long time. Be the person who shows up and puts their running shoes on every day before you worry about how far you're running and what kind of workout you're doing and all that type of stuff. There's this thing called Goodhart's Law that says a measure ceases to be a good measure when it becomes the target. And so the point is, like imagine you're trying to lose weight. Uh, if you use the scale as a measurement, as a data point, then yeah, it can be useful as like one signal into your overall health. But if it becomes the target, if the whole mission of getting in shape becomes about making the scale go lower, well then you start doing a lot of unhealthy things just to get the scale to move. Um, you know, you may sacri you may do some crazy juice cleanse or some kind of radical diet, or um, you end up doing unhealthy things in the name of moving the number. And I think that there's a lot of application of that in creativity and business as well. If the number becomes the target, then uh, you kind of lose sight of the bigger picture. And so I, I feel like I try to remind myself that measurements are just a, a piece of the larger puzzle and I can use them to inform and make sure I'm moving in the right direction, but don't spend too much time obsessing over any individual metric. Why is something rewarding? Why do you find it rewarding? And one of the reasons is because it satisfies the craving that preceded the action. So um, one way to put this is that perceived value motivates you to act. Actual value motivates you to repeat. So it, when you buy something on Amazon, you don't actually buy the product. Like you don't, you don't buy the book cause you don't actually have it yet. What you buy is the image the product creates in your mind. Mm -hmm. You buy your expectation or the perceived value of the sales page. Um, it's only after you get the book and you read it and you're like, Oh, this is really good. That's when the actual value, it satisfies that craving you had before and it reinforces, Oh, Hey, this was enjoyable. I should do it again next time. Mm -hmm. Um, so you kind of have both of those on, on each side of the, the behavior. Is there such thing as, uh, I guess, central habits that can help to shift and transform other aspects of your life? Because that's something that I've noticed a little bit where if I start eating better or if I start going to the gym every day, it's almost like a domino or ripple mm. effect where these other habits start to pick up naturally because yeah. I'm starting to feel better. So like, cause I've been going to the gym five days a week. So now when I come home, I don't feel like binging out on junk food. I feel like eating better food or if I wake up early, uh, is that something you've noticed in your research? Yeah, sure. So there are two ways to answer this question. So the first way is um, what you're describing is often sometimes called a keystone habit. Uh, and the idea is you do one thing and it like ripples into other areas of your life. And so for me, it's exercise. Like if I go to the gym, then I get the benefits of exercise, but I also tend to eat better. I like, for some reason, I just don't want to waste it. Um, I also focus more. So I have sort of that like post workout high, uh, after I, after I work out, uh, and then I sleep better because I'm tired from the workout, which means I wake up the next morning and I have better energy. Um, and at no point was I trying to build better sleep habits or energy habits or focus habits or nutrition habits, but all that kind of just came as a side effect of doing this one thing of going to the gym. Hmm. 
Some other common uh, keystone habits are budgeting. Sometimes people say when they pay off debt, you'll then they'll like start to get in shape or they, um, you know, build, but they're more social and have better relationships or like there's all kinds of things that kind of come out of that. Um, going for a daily walk is a really big one. It's a very common one among creators in particular. There's a book called Daily Rituals by Mason Curie. And he basically just writes down like what, I don't know, it's 100 or 150 famous like creators and scientists and whatever, what their daily routines were. And a lot of them were raging alcoholics and on amphetamines and all kinds of other stuff. But the ones who uh, were more healthy, a daily habit, a daily habit like walking was a really big part of their routine. Um, visualization is a big one, especially for performers like a comedian or something. They'll often visualize the same kind of result or professional athletes uh, before they step out on the stage or step out on the court. This is a real pitfall for a lot of people with habits is they have this like all or nothing mentality. They'll like start this diet and then they go binge eat with their friends for, you know, like happy hour or something. Uh, and then they're like, oh, well, you know, I blew the diet. Guess I shouldn't even bother. Right. And I think that this is um, this is a mantra that I like to keep in mind with habits. The, I mean, the truth is every habit streak is going to end at some point. You know, like when I when I launched my site, I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday for three years. But then I signed this book deal and I needed to change that. And so that streak ended. And you've probably had a variety of times this year where you've done meditation for five days in a row or seven days in a row or 12 days in a row. But then at some point that streak broke. And the key is never miss twice. You know, like if you get back on, if you can get back on track quickly, then that's a huge win. Um, I've seen this in a lot of areas now as I started to study people who are like top performers, whether it's sports or business. But it's, it's not that they make, they don't make mistakes. People at the top levels, they make mistakes too, but they just get back on quite back on track more quickly. Um, so it's almost never the first mistake that ruins you. It's like the spiral of repeated mistakes that follows. Um, I think in the book, I have a line, something like missing once is a mistake. Missing twice is the start of a new habit. And what you don't want is to start that new habit. You want to never miss twice and just get back on track as quickly as possible. And if you can keep that in mind, um, it can end up being pretty powerful for consistency. You know, it's like, even if you only did that, if you never missed twice, if you did it and then missed and they're like, well, I'm not going to miss twice. You did it again and then you missed and then you do it at least 50% of the time. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think that's, uh, that says something about your mentality that you keep coming back to it, even though every now and then it doesn't work out. In order to change behavior, design it in any meaningful way, you need to be aware of it first. But usually when people become aware of their habits or think about them, you know, like you might smoke or bite your nails or something on autopilot. But then if you start to think about it, well, you feel guilty about it. You know, you start to judge yourself. As soon as you start to judge yourself, then you're not in a great position to change because you. what ends up happening a lot of the time, this has happened actually with a couple of campaigns uh, that have tried to scare smokers into not smoking by showing them pictures of blackened lungs or scare obese people into not eating as much by talking about the, the detriments of being overweight what happens is people get really anxious and stressed. They feel guilty and worried, and then they resort. Amplify They resort behavior. to their preferred habit for right. dealing with that, which means they end up smoking more or eating more or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I think there is a benefit to looking at it in an unemotional, forensic way. Mm -hmm. um, and one way to do that is to say there are no good or bad habits. Uh, there are just behaviors that serve you in a particular way, and the goal is to try to find a behavior that serves you in a better way. I'll give you an example of a good habit and a bad habit. So for good habits, you want the physical environment to make it obvious and easy for you to do the behavior. You know, so like I um, like have a pull-up bar in your room. Exactly. You're trying to do 100 pull-ups a day. Right. Like have it hanging over your door. As opposed to even if you had one, but it was in the closet. Because right. you just half the time you wouldn't or, remember to take it out. Or it's at the gym upstairs right. or down the street. No. Um, you know, I have a friend who he wanted to practice uh, guitar more, and so he left his guitar in the middle of his living room, and that was just so he'd walk past it a hundred times a day. Pick it up and becomes play. much easier, right? Bad habits are the same way. Um, so, but in reverse, instead of making it obvious, you want to make it invisible. Um, you know, take like which is just talking about video games. A lot of people feel like they watch too much, spend too much time watching TV or playing video games or watching a screen. But if you walk into pretty much any living room, where do all the couches and chairs face? They the all TV. face the television. So it's like, what is that room designed to get you to do? Um, Turn it on. Yeah. So you can restructure that environment to make it less likely that you'll fall into that habit. And there are a variety of things you could do. You could take the remote control and put it inside like a drawer so you don't see it. You could put the television behind a wall unit or a cabinet so that it's less visible. But you could also increase the friction with the task. So you could like 
unplug your TV after each use and only plug it back in if you can say the name of the show that you want to watch. So you can't like mindlessly pull up Netflix and just mm. find something. Um, or you could take the batteries out of the remote control so that it's an extra like five to 10 seconds to turn on. And maybe that's enough time to be like, do I really want to watch something right now? Right. I'm just doing this mindlessly. Yeah. Um, if you really want to be extreme. Don't have a TV. Yes, you could that's what get I rid this. of the TV entirely or what? take it off the wall and put it in the closet <laughs> and only take it out when you really that's want big. to watch something. This is one of the most common, uh, I guess, criticisms or complaints that people will ask me about with habits is like, well, you know, I don't want to be robotic, right? Like, I, what, what about like spontaneity? What about the, you know, freedom and doing what I want? You know, I don't want to like pigeonhole myself in this lifestyle. But uh, it's this false dichotomy because habits don't restrict freedom. They create it. You know, it's often the people who have the worst habits that have the least amount of freedom. It's the people who have terrible financial habits that are always wondering like where the next dollar will come from. Or it's the people who have poor learning habits that are always one like feeling like they're behind the curve. Um, or people who have poor fitness habits that are always struggling to find energy. But on the other hand, if you have your habits dialed in, if you like, you know, have your your fitness habits figured out, if you've got your finances handled, then you actually have way more freedom than you did before. Now you actually have the space to, you have the energy to do what you want. You have the strength to do what you want. You have the financial ability to spend time in areas that you want. Um, and all of that comes from getting your habits handled. So it's, it's, uh, it is a little counterintuitive, this idea that like discipline equals freedom or habits do not restrict freedom, they create it. But it's it's true that if you can handle that stuff, if the fundamentals of life are dialed in, then you've got space for spontaneity and creativity and freedom and all the other stuff. Every behavior is followed by some kind of outcome. It's just basic cause and effect. Um, and if the immediate outcome is favorable, is enjoyable, you have a reason to repeat it in the future. It's kind of like donuts. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Keep right. Repeating. It's like that example. If you, if you, um, if you feel good, if you feel satisfied right after you do something, then it's like this positive emotional signal. And it's like, yeah, I should do this again. Yeah. So you can see this actually business is a really interesting example with this. There are a lot of products and some of the most successful products have some type of immediate satisfaction that is layered into them. So uh, toothpaste is a very common example. There's no reason a toothpaste needs to taste like mint, but it does because the minty flavor and the refreshingness of it, it makes your, it gives your mouth this clean feel. Mm -hmm. It's more satisfying. So you have a reason to do it again in the future. Um, I heard an interesting one recently about car manufacturers that some of them are adding a fake, guttural roar to the the car or the truck when you press the accelerator because it just adds to the actual natural sound of the engine so it makes it more satisfying to mm. step on the gas and to drive the car so there are a variety of examples like this but if you can add and the key is it needs to be immediate right mm. so like this is um in the book i refer to this as the cardinal rule of behavior change which is behaviors that are immediately rewarded get repeated behaviors that are immediately punished get avoided. And it's really about the speed of how quickly you feel successful. If it feels good, you have a reason to do it again. Um, Is that why video games do so well? Video games are masters at this. They're masters at it. So um, they're masters actually at a variety of, of aspects related to habit formation. So. One is they're really good at this immediate satisfaction. There are all kinds of things. You're actually constantly getting feedback in a video game. I Even if you're just I, running, yeah. you hear the pitter patter of the steps. It's, That's it's gratifying. Feedback. It's yeah. The jingles of like picking up another power up or um, you know seeing a kill or something like that. Whatever the game is, you're always getting constant feedback. Sound, uh, things that are on screen, they're really good at dripping out. Watching the, the score increase in the top corner, that is immediate feedback. Um, so they have all these different ways of making you feel satisfied. And when you see that progress, you have a reason to continue in the future. This is one of the, one of the most effective forms of immediate satisfaction is progress. Mm. As soon as you feel progress, you have a reason to continue. It feels really good to see that you're making headway. My publisher told me uh, there's something to the effect of like, we write the books we need ourselves. And that's... Uh, it's funny because, you know, when I write about habits, a lot of people assume that I have my habits so dialed in because I'm the guy writing about right. it, but I'm writing about it to learn about it. You know, I'm writing about it to try to improve. I consider my readers and myself to be peers, right? We're all just kind of experimenting and operating and, and working on stuff. And, uh, the only difference is I just share the lessons when I learn them. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, um, I definitely had an internal desire for that. Uh, and then there have been a variety of areas in my life where I've had to implement that athletics, um, photography, uh, writing and building a business, of course. And all of those have been kind of like 
test labs for me to, to put the ideas into practice. Right, but why zero in on this? On habits? Yeah. Well, I think that a little bit of it comes back to what you just mentioned a few minutes ago about how important habits are. Uh, I didn't know this at first. So I was a baseball player for many years. And as any athlete can tell you, there are all kinds of habits that you have at practice, rituals, things like that. And I was benefiting from that. Um, You know, my strength coach would tell me to do something or my coaches would hold me accountable to certain habits. And that would help pull the rest of my life in line. Mm -hmm. You know, I always did better in school when I had sports as well. Uh, it It would like give me something to anchor my day around. And so... I knew that it was working, but I didn't have a language for it. Um, And so it was only until maybe five years after my career ended and I finished graduate school and I started like looking into this stuff a little bit more that I started to come across the science of habit formation and behavior change and developed a language for it and started to write about it. So I kind of implicitly knew it was important, Mm -hmm. but didn't discover that uh, the actual way to write about it until later. Now, the second thing here, though, is that I, as I dug into the topic more, I started to like unearth these layers and realize, wow, this is actually even more important than I thought. And this comes back to the point that you made a few minutes ago, which is that habits are, one of the phrases I'd like to use is that pretty much any of the results in your life are a lagging measure of your habits, right? So your right. weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. Your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your clutter is a lagging measure of your cleaning habits. Like the outcomes are just the, the manifestation of the behaviors that preceded them. Right. Um, so you kind of get what you repeat in that way. Well, that makes sense. People understand that that's important. So that's one reason why habits are, are crucial, but there's another thing that habits do that is even more central, even more important. And that is that your habits are the way that you embody a particular identity. So every morning that you make your bed, you embody the habits of, uh, you embody the identity of an organized person, someone who's clean. Every time you go to the gym, you embody the identity of someone who is fit. Every time you sit down to write a sentence or a page, uh, you embody the identity of someone who's a writer. And so in that sense, habits are like, every action you take is kind of like a vote for the type of person that you believe that you are. And as you take these actions, you build up evidence of a particular identity. And pretty soon, your beliefs have something to like root themselves in. It's like, man, I, you know, I've showed up at the gym for four days a week for the last three months. I guess like I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. Um, and that, I think, is the true reason why habits are so important. Uh, once I realized how beliefs and behaviors are connected, that there's like this two-way street, um, then I've started to think, all right, maybe this is really something. Not only does it deliver those external results, the clean room or the, you know, bigger bank account, but also the internal results of shaping your sense of self image and what you believe. Let's say that you wanted to build a better, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of breaking a good or building a good habit and breaking a bad one. So one of the laws is to make it obvious. And this largely comes down to like what we're exposed to each day, each day and minimalism and simplicity plays a big role in this. Um, in the book, I call it environment design. That's basically the strategy. So for a long time, I realized that I brushed my teeth twice a day, but I didn't floss consistently. And when I looked at that habit, one of the reasons that I wasn't flossing consistently is because the floss was hidden in the drawer in the bathroom. So I just wouldn't see it, you know, like I wouldn't open up the drawer and, and remember So I bought a little bowl and got some of the pre-made flossers and put them in the bowl and placed it right next to my toothbrush. So now I brush my teeth, put the toothbrush down, pick the flosser up. It's right there. Just that one little environment design change is pretty much all I needed to do uh, to build the habit of flossing every day. Um, On the other side, let's say, you know, a lot of people feel like they spend too much time watching TV or playing video games or just looking at a screen. But if you walk into pretty much any living room, where do all the couches and chairs face? They all face the television. So it's like, what is that room designed to get you to do? It's designed to get you to watch TV. So there are a variety of uh, levels to this. You could, for example, uh, take the remote and take it off of the coffee table and put it inside a drawer, or you could take the television and put it inside like a wall unit or a cabinet so that you don't see it. Um, You could also increase the friction of the task. So you could like take the batteries out of the remote Um, after each use and then you know it's an extra five or ten seconds put it in maybe that's just enough time for you to think do i really want to watch something or am i just doing this mindlessly you could um, unplug the tv after each individual use and then only plug it in if you can say the name of the show you want to watch so you can't like mindlessly browse on netflix and i mean if you really wanted to be extreme about it you could take the tv off the wall put it in the closet and then only take it out when you really wanted to watch something 
But the point here, and this is kind of the, the principle of environment design in general, which is you want to put fewer steps between you and the good behaviors and more steps between you and the bad ones. And imagine the cumulative impact of living in an environment that exposes you to the cues of your positive habits and reduces the cues of your negative habits. It's kind of like you're just gently being nudged in the right direction each day. And that's just one of the, of the ways that you can sort of design a system that leads you into better habits. Mm. Just take someone who's trying to get in shape. I mean, people will, what kind of protein powder should I get? What knee sleeves do I need? What are, what are the best uh, weightlifting shoes? And all that stuff is like the last 2% of difference. That It's mostly like, don't miss workouts and get your reps in. This is what in the book I call the difference between motion and action. Uh, action can actually deliver a result, uh, but motion is related to that, but never will. Um, you know, like going to the gym and, uh, talking to a personal trainer about signing up, that's fine. That's related to getting in shape, but it doesn't matter how many times you talk to a personal trainer, you're never going to get in shape. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas like doing 10 squats that actually can do something. It's like talking to the trainer's motion, doing squats is action. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of times people get trapped in motion. They get trapped in analysis paralysis because it uh, is a way to feel like you're making progress without running the risk of failure. There are some experiences in life that have to be lived to be understood fully. Uh, not everything is like that, but some things do. And that's, that's one thing that's challenging. I think about, there's a Naval Ravikant investor. He's got a quote where he says something to the effect of, um, good decisions come from experience and uh, experience comes from bad decisions. So <laughs> basically that. you like, <laughs> you got to kind of like try and fail and then you learn and that's, that's how it happens. It's all about lessons. Um, so part of that I think is unavoidable. That's just how it goes. Nobody is going to make perfect decisions throughout life. And hopefully, um, you know, an unexamined failure only remains a failure An examined failure can become an excess, a success. So hopefully you're at least learning when you make the bad choices. Every day I try to leave my phone in another room outside of my office, at least until lunch, because then I get like a four hour block of time in the morning uh, where I can just work without any right. distraction. Yeah. And um, it's funny how quickly you don't, like if my phone was on me in the morning, I would check it like, you know, every five minutes or whatever. But when it's out of the room, I don't even find myself wanting to, I never walk up the stairs to go check it, even though it's only 30 right. seconds away. Wow. So it's, it's interesting how, um, little we actually want to do these things, but we just do them all the time because they're obvious and easy. And I think the key is to invert that. Take the things that are the bad habits, the distractions, the procrastinations, the unproductive uses of time, and make them more invisible, reduce exposure, and less uh, less easy to do. And take the things that are good habits and make it the equivalent of having your phone on you all the time, mm. right? Make it right in front of you, make it obvious, make it easy, make it um, yeah. you know frictionless. What really changes your your outcomes or what really moves your life in a positive direction is not a single like one percent change or a single uh, little habit. It's a collection of them all organized towards the same like overall goal or overall outcome. So you know sometimes people will they get like a you know a Fitbit and they start they get a Fitbit and they start walking ten thousand steps a day or something like that, and then they get frustrated after three months because they haven't seen this change in the mirror or this change on the scale or whatever. But it's like, well, that's good, but that's just one habit related to your health. You don't need um, you don't need a single little habit. You need like a thousand of them. And once you kind of build this collection of them all moving you in the same direction, it's kind of like each one adds a little grain of sand to the side of the scale and eventually you tip the scales in your favor. And I think that's another reason to start with one habit at a time is that you naturally sort of pick up other behaviors that are related to the overall thing that you're working on in the moment. And, um, and that helps to keep you focused rather than trying to do two or three things and then you get scattered. If your expectations are sky high, um, you know, like if you set, I have a, a friend who's a writer and he, his goal is to write one sentence every day. Um, and it sounds absurd, but if you set the expectation that low, then he can feel successful pretty much every day. He always can feel satisfied by sticking to the habit, which gives him a reason to come back again the next day. And sometimes he writes a full page and sometimes it's just a sentence. But um, if he had set a goal of writing a thousand words a day, there would be some days where he couldn't do that. And then suddenly he's feeling bad about that. It, like, what if he wrote one sentence that day? He would feel bad about it, even though he still wrote that day, but it's just because of his expectation. So there's a little bit of like mental play that's going on there in how we kind of, we sabotage ourselves by setting the bar so high. That's especially true in the beginning. I think that it becomes less true 
for maybe the one or two areas where you really want to be a master in life. Like if something's really important to you and you want peak performance, you want to be a professional athlete, you want to be uh, you know, among the best authors or something like that, then maybe uh, your strategy needs to change. But for most people, most of the time, the strategy is probably better to set the bar low, find a way to be satisfied and show up each day. And then once you've built the habit, then you optimize from there. This is... Um, I had a, a reader who ended up losing over 100 pounds. And one of the things that he did was he went to the gym, um, but he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. And so it sounds so weird because it's a complete opposite of what most people do to build a habit. But he, what he was doing was he was mastering the art of showing up. Um, and so for six weeks, he went to the gym, he'd go in, do like half an exercise, and then five minutes would be up and he'd go home. And eventually he got to the point where he's like, you know, I'm coming here all the time. I kind of feel like staying longer, right? But that's that's the opposite of the person who takes the intermediate CrossFit class and like kills themselves for three weeks and then it feels totally fried and, you know, gives up. And then three months later, they're like, oh, I got to get back in shape. Um, and so a habit must be established before it can be improved, right? Often we optimize for the finish line. We think about the outcome that we want. We think about like, oh, I want to lose 20 pounds or I want to earn six figures this year or whatever the, the thing is. Um, but instead, if you just focus on the first two minutes of a behavior, or in this guy's case, the first five minutes of the behavior, and you optimize for the starting line, you master the art of showing up, but then you have options. Then you, can, you actually have something that you can improve. If you're not the type of person who shows up at the gym, uh, even if it's just for five minutes, it doesn't even matter what your ideal workout plan is or whatever. Like you can't do anything because you're not there. And so um, in that sense, I think that it's often helpful for people, especially in the beginning, to scale a habit down to the first two minutes, master the art of showing up. And then once you're the type of person who does it every day, figure out a way to improve. In my personal life, you know, like there's a moment around 515 each night. My wife gets home from work and either we change into our workout clothes and we go to the gym or we don't change into our workout clothes and we watch, you know, reruns of the office in order to take out or whatever. And really the next two hours are kind of determined by that decisive moment of whether we change into our workout clothes or not. If we change clothes, then like everything else is going to happen automatically. We're going to drive to the gym. I'll get under the bar. I'll do It's already pre-decided basically. So one of the realizations of this, and it comes back to your kind of central question of what, are, you know, what are the most important habits to build or are there ones that ripple into other areas of life? If you can just master maybe five or 10 decisive moments throughout the day, these little kind of two minute chunks that determine the next block of time, you really only have to focus your attention and energy on that. And the, the, the rest of it kind of comes easily. You don't have to do that much uh, if you can master the right moments. It's kind of like judo for your personal habits. You know, you apply the pressure in the right place and everything else kind of falls in, in line. The reason a lot of people struggle with that conscious activity is that they pick things that are too big in the beginning. Right, so, I call lower, lower the bar. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the two-minute rule helps you lower the bar by saying a new habit should is something that should take less than two minutes to do. So you take whatever habit you're trying to build, whatever ambitious plan you have, read 40 books a year becomes read one page, or do yoga four days a week becomes take out my yoga mat. And sometimes people resist this a little bit when I say it first because they think, all right, well, I know the real goal isn't just to like take my yoga mat out. I know I actually want to do the workout. And if I know that, and it's like this mental trick, and I know it's a trick, why would I fall for it? And so my suggestion, if you feel that way, is force yourself for the first few days to only do it for two minutes. I forget which study it was, but it was, said something along the lines. It was a dietary study. If you said, I can't have that food, oh, yeah. you were far more likely to eat it than if you said, I don't eat that food. Yeah, I right? read because about this one. That's a decision, right? I think it was in Ferris's four-hour body. Yeah, they brought people in. They did this. They had them do like some test that uh, was just fake. Uh, you know, it's just they they thought that was the actual experiment, but of course, in psychology experiments, it's never the actual experiment. But anyway, as they walked out of the room, they offered them either a chocolate bar or um, uh, some healthy. I don't know, healthy uh, snack, a granola bar or something. I don't know. Anyway, but during the test, they had had to either repeat phrases or fill out phrases that were like, uh, I don't eat ice cream or I don't, you know, uh, miss workouts or things like that, or I won't or uh, I can't. Uh, yeah, I don't or I can't. I can't eat ice cream. I can't work out. Uh, I can't miss a workout, that kind of thing. And all the people who said I can't, who felt restrictive, were far more likely to opt for the chocolate bar. Uh, than the people who said, I don't, which again comes back to this form of identity. Um, you know, imagine, uh, this is an example I mentioned in the book. Imagine you have two people who are trying to quit smoking 
and you offer both of them a cigarette. And the first person says, oh, no, thanks, I'm trying to quit. And the second person says, oh, no, thanks, I'm not a smoker. Same thing, they're both turning down the cigarette, but the first person still identifies as a smoker. They identify as someone who's trying to do something that isn't them. Whereas the other person sh signals the shift in identity. Oh, no, thanks, I'm not a smoker. They no longer see themselves in that way. And it's one thing to say, I'm the type of person who wants this. It's another thing to say, I'm the type of person who is this. And in a sense, true behavior change is actually identity change. Because once you believe that that's who you are, you're not even really trying to change your habits anymore. You're just acting in alignment with the type of person you already believe yourself to be. It's like, no, I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. So I'm not, I'm not like convincing myself to go to the gym. That's just who I am. I just work out, you know? Um, so uh, identity change is, is at the root of pretty much all behavior change. Social norms. Society leans heavily on us all. So uh, if you, there are just broad examples of this. Family so pressure, religious pressure, media pressure, all peer, kinds of stuff. Peer pressure, everything. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's say, so just some broad examples. Uh, you walk into an elevator and you turn around to face the front. You have a job interview and you wear a suit and tie or a dress or something nice. There's no reason it has to be that way, right? Like you could face the back of the elevator. You could wear a swimsuit to a job interview, but you don't do that because it violates the shared norms of the group, mm -hmm. right? It violates the shared society, expectations yeah. of what that society has. But that's not that's true not only in a broad sense that we're part of these tribes, like big tribes, you know, what it means to be a Christian or to be American or to be uh, Australian or whatever, but it's also true in the small tribes that we belong to, what it means to be a neighbor on this street or a member of your local CrossFit gym or to volunteer for a local organization. All of those tribes, all of those groups that you belong to have a set of shared expectations, a set of shared norms. And the key, if you wanna build habits that last, if you wanna change the way that you interpret cues, is to join a group where your the desired behavior is the normal behavior, right? Like there are, mm. there are plenty of people who they wanna work out, but going to the gym feels like a lot to them. Uh, it feels hard, feels like a sacrifice. But there are also people who go to the gym every week and it's just normal. It doesn't feel like an obligation. That's the desired behavior is the normal behavior. It's their lifestyle. Right. Same thing for uh, musicians. You know, like if you want to learn an instrument, hang out with people who play all the time. You know, like if you hang out with a bunch of musicians, it's like, well, yeah. That's what we, we do all day. Yeah, we play four days a week. If we play seven days a week yeah. because it just happens. That's, that's what the tribe does. The caveat to this, and the thing that I don't see people mention a lot, is that the reason social norms influence our behavior so much is because we want to belong to the tribe. We want to be friends mm -hmm. with those people. And so we don't want to lose the friendship or lose belonging over violating the norms. Yeah, you're not going to hang out with a bunch of vegans and have pork right? and just like be the only one eating that. You won't hang out with them for very long because you're right. not going to be friends with them anymore. Exactly. Right? They'll kick you out. So you want to rise to the standard of that group, of that community. So the key, I think, is to join a group where your desired behavior is a normal behavior and you already have something else in common with that group. So. Uh, Steve Cam is a good example of this. So like Steve runs Nerd Fitness, right? And all these people want to get in shape who are coming into his community, but they also love Star Wars or Batman or Spider-Man or you know all these other things mm -hmm. that nerds are into. And if you show up, it can be intimidating to want to get in shape or you know work out the first time, but if you can connect with the group over your mutual love of Star Wars, then you're like, oh, well, I'm friends with these people, and now I also want to pick up those other habits with them because I want to belong with the group because we're already friends. And so I think you can apply that methodology mm -hmm. to most um, new tribes that you join. Don't just join a new tribe because they have the desired behavior. Also try to find a way that you can overlap with them. Find some shared context. Some other stuff too, yeah. That you can bond over, and then it's easier to adopt like the habits. Musicians that like to be healthy. Yeah, right. If you want to do both, right? It's sure. like finding that even subgroup. It's like, hey, we love you know we love playing music, and then also you're going to start eating better because we all want to eat healthy. This is coming from someone who's been very goal oriented for a long time. So I would set goals for the grades I wanted to get in school or the weights I wanted to lift in the gym or the amount of revenue I wanted in my business or how many email subscribers I wanted, like all of that. And at some point I realized, you know, I'm setting all these goals. Like, am I actually achieving some of them? And sometimes I would, but there were plenty of times where I failed. And so I had this realization that, well, if that's the case, then setting a goal cannot be the thing that means whether or not I achieve success. And if you think about this, the winners and losers in any domain, a lot of the time they have the same goals. You know, like every person who applies for a job has the goal of getting the job. 
Um, every Olympian has the goal of winning the gold medal. And so if winners and losers have the same goals, then the goal can't be the thing that makes the difference. Um, and I don't mean that goals are useless. I think goals are actually quite useful for setting a sense of direction or knowing, um, you know, which basically what area the, the boat should be pointed in, what direction the boat should be pointed in and where you're trying to row. But once you've decided that, it's probably more useful to put the goal on the shelf and focus exclusively on the system or the process. And um, in my language, habits make up the system. And uh, they're like this collection of, ha of behaviors and patterns that you perform each day. And when you put them all together, you end up with this system that delivers a result. And whatever your results are in life or in business or wherever, your current system is perfectly designed to deliver them. It has to be by definition. That's why you're getting those results. So if you want different results, what you need is not really a different goal. We need is a different system. Habits allow you to solve the problems of life with less energy and effort than you would otherwise need. And, you know, all life requires energy to exist. If you if you don't have energy, then you don't survive. And so energy is very precious for that reason. And your brain is looking for ways to conserve it whenever possible. Um, you know, this makes just logical sense, right? Like if you imagine like our ancestors living on the savanna, if you could forage for berries in a patch that's 100 meters away, then why would you bother foraging for berries in a patch that's like 10,000 meters away or on the <laughs> other side of the mountain or whatever, right? Like you're going to seek the path of least resistance to get the results that you want. And habits are sort of a, a shortcut, a mental shortcut that your brain uses to, to do that kind of thing on a daily basis. So take, for example, the habit of tying your shoe. Um, the first time you do it, you don't know how to tie your shoe and you have to think carefully about how to make the knots and someone has to teach you how to do it and so on. But after you do it a hundred times or a thousand times or 10,000 times, pretty soon you can tie your shoes while you're talking to somebody or thinking about your to-do list for the day. Um, you just pretty, pretty much can do it on autopilot. And so in a small sense, tying a shoe is like a problem that you face on a daily basis and your brain has automated the solution and habits allow you to do that in all different areas of life all the time. It, you automate the solutions to the recurring problems in life, which means you can focus on other things and direct your attention elsewhere. So for that reason, habits are like so central to our experience that we often overlook them. Like you don't even really think about brushing your teeth or tying your shoes or unplugging the toaster after each use or all these other things that you do each day. But your habits are the thing that help you function and operate in the world in a more efficient manner. We interpret the stimuli and the data, the uh, cues in our life differently based on what our viewpoint is at that time, based on what our personality or our, uh, sorry, not our personality, our personal viewpoint is based on what you believe, your self-image. So you know, I mean, you see this all the time with politics. You have the same news story that runs on the TV, but then a liberal and a conservative interpret that data in completely different ways. And it's because of uh, what's getting echoed back to them, because of how they see themselves, because of uh, what filter they're running that data through. And the same thing is true if we're talking about weight loss or whatever else. You know, if like you see a particular number on the scale and the thing that's being echoed back to you is I want to lose 20 pounds and feel great. Then suddenly you don't feel good about that number. If the same thing, if the uh, thing that's getting echoed back to you is I've stuck to workouts for seven days in a row and I feel more energetic and healthy, then you see the number in a totally different way. Same number, uh, just different interpretation. So I think it, it's important, uh, but it's not the whole story. Um, and some of the the things that also influence things are, you know, like what we talked about, making things obvious, and making them easy, um, but making it satisfying. The which is the fourth kind of major lever that I talk about in the book. That's crucial for getting people to come back, um, and that can come in many different forms. Um, there's a so I, I guess I'll just lay the context for this real quick. There, this is really interesting to look at with a lot of products. Um, so. Chewing gum is a good example. For many years, for hundreds of years, chewing gum was around, but it was like kind of this bland resin. It was just chewy, but it wasn't tasty. And Wrigley launched in like 1880, 1890, and they came out with Juicy Fruit and Spearmint and Double Mint. And suddenly gum was chewy and it had this immediate flavor. There was like this immediate reward to chewing it. And it took off. They became the biggest chewing gum, chewing gum company in the world. Um, and today, many companies are doing the same kind of thing where they're trying to layer in a little bit of extra satisfaction with the product. So a couple of years ago, BMW came out with a car that when you press on the accelerator, it'll pipe extra engine growl through the stereo in the, in the car. So it's like more satisfying to step on the gas. Um, <laughs> 
Ford just came up with another one where they uh, they the engine noise is still there, but they have this valve that it'll only open and let the engine noise into the car interior um, and past all the soundproofing if you really slam on the gas and like you know rev the RPMs up. But if you just drive like normal, it'll keep it soft and quiet. Um, and so the uh, the point there is that all of those uh, products, cars or chewing gum and many others, they find ways to layer immediate satisfaction into the experience. And when you do that people want to repeat it more. Anytime you have some kind of enjoyment or a satisfying ending to a behavior, it's like this positive signal in your brain that says, hey, that felt good, you should do this again next time. And that's what really gets a habit to stick. Uh, All the other stuff that we talked about, um, making habits attractive, making them more obvious, making it more convenient to do, that gets a habit to start the first time or makes it easier for you to do it right then. But the only reason you come back to it is because it's satisfying. And it's really about the speed of the satisfaction. And this is something that I call the cardinal rule of behavior change, which is behaviors that are immediately rewarded get repeated and behaviors that are immediately punished get avoided. And the more that you can have that positive emotional feeling right away, the more reason you have to come back to a habit in the future. If you were coaching someone who said, I have no clue what I'm supposed to do with my life. Um, I'm lost. I have all these bad habits. I smoke, I drink, I eat donuts every day. Mm. I have no job, Um, my room is sloppy, and I'm just depressed. What would you say to them to get started with changing their life around in the form of better habits? Well, you just need to pick one thing, first of all. I think that uh, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, um, one of the most powerful forms of motivation is progress. So seeing some progress, I mean, it could be as simple as make your bed each day. Right? Like, but just doing that, embodying the identity of someone who's getting better, who's making progress, just pick one thing mm-hmm. uh, and use that as, this is true, I mean, Lewis, this is something you've probably seen with a lot of people that you've talked to, but yep. habits are the foundation for mastery. So if you, you know, say, take, a, take a sport like basketball, um, you need to be able to dribble with both hands without thinking before you can worry about what strategy you're running on offense or what kind of you know strategic play you're going to run or what your defensive scheme is or all this other stuff right like you need to automate the fundamentals of the craft before you can worry about the next level of performance same thing is true for chess you know like you need to know how the chess pieces move automatically without thinking about it before you can get into all right what is my strategy going to do and i'm going to do this and they're going to do that and so I think this is true, not just at the peak levels of performance, that you integrate these habits and use habits as the foundation for the next level of performance, but also true when you're getting started. Just build one small thing, carve out a 1% change, a 1% improvement, and use that as a stepping stone to the next uh, mm-hmm. level. True behavior change is really identity change um, because you're, you're not really looking to go from the type of person who doesn't run to the type of person who can run a 5K. That's fine. That's good. It's the outcome. But the goal is not to run a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. Mm -hmm. The goal is not to write a book. The goal is to become a writer. And once you identify as that type of person, in a sense, you're not even really pursuing behavior change anymore. You're just acting in alignment with the type of person that you already believe that you are. Right. It's like one thing to say, I want this. It's something different to say, I am this. One of the most effective feelings, one of the most motivating states is the feeling of progress. Yeah. And if you're focused on uh, feeling guilty, blaming yourself for not improving, feeling like, oh, I'm not able to build better habits because something's wrong with me, that's not a very uh, productive state to be in. Whereas if you shift it and say, all right, the problem is not me, the problem is the system. And if I'm going to change the system, then I can do X, Y, and Z. And we can talk about a variety of those strategies. But each time you do that, you take action and you build progress and momentum. And so I I think it is a much more productive way to approach the process of change because it gives you something to actually work on. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the rest of these strategies, a lot of the time it's about stuff like, uh, you know, think positive or fake it till you make it or stuff like that. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Like certainly if you want to think positive is sounds better than thinking negatively. Um, but my focus is much more on practical action steps. How can we make the process of behavior change actionable and give you something that to do to design a system where you're more likely to succeed? And so I think that's just a better place to spend your time and energy. Most people are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan stopping along the side of the road to help, uh, help a fallen person, help someone in need. Well, 
Princeton, their theology school, decided to run this uh, experiment. And they brought in a bunch of theology students. They said, all right, we're all familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. We're going to break you up into groups, and you're going to go teach in different rooms across campus. You're going to teach this story. And so they started talking about you know, how they were going to deliver the presentation and so on. And they had a couple different cohorts. The one cohort, they said, all right, just go ahead and you know, go off and, uh, and deliver the presentation. So they went off to their rooms. Um, the second one, though, they did something interesting. They sent the group off. But on their way to the, uh, well, they sent the group off and they said, by the way, we're running a little bit behind, right? You, you don't have very long to get there. It takes about 10 minutes. You only got five. So we kind of need to hurry. Um, you're probably already going to be late. So they're in a rush. They know they're going to go give this presentation. On the way, they planted an actor on the, uh, on the campus. And this actor is laying on the ground, hurt, moaning in pain. And so they scream twice and then they cry out. And every single group went right past the person in need to go give a presentation about helping a person in need. <laughs> right? The one person even stepped over the guy who was in pain in order to get there. Now, the point of this, and what I'd like to start talking about now, is the danger of being goal-focused and goal-oriented. These people had a goal, right, to deliver a presentation. And they were so one-sided, so narrow-minded, so focused on that goal, that they miss the bigger picture and the perspective of what they should have been doing in the first place. And I think that this can be a danger of goals often. And so instead, I would like to encourage us to focus on systems, systems rather than goals. Here are some examples. If you're a coach, your goal is to win a championship, but your system is what your team does at practice each day. If you're a writer, your goal might be to write a book, maybe even write a best-selling book, but your system is how you write each week, the schedule that you follow. If you're an entrepreneur, your goal could be to build a million dollar business or a $10 million business, but the system is the sales and marketing process that you have. The systems are what actually make the difference. They're what drive the results. And what I've seen, having goals is great. Having a vision, having a dream is nice. It's important to know where you're going and where you're headed. It's important to have some clarity of focus, to know that we're moving in this direction. But once you know that, having the goal on paper makes very little difference. And committing to the system and showing up every day drives a lot of results. Having a coach forces you to be aware of things that you would otherwise overlook, right? Like as you, this is what I call the downside of building good habits, which is you build habits and in the beginning you develop fluency and skill and ability and things become easier. But after a little while, once a habit has been established, the downside of having a habit is that you can do it good enough on autopilot, which means that you start to overlook your mistakes mm, and not think about how to get better. Yeah, yeah. And so what you need is a coach to keep you on that razor's edge so that you, you keep building habits, but it also forces you to stay aware of what the next level of performance is. And that's kind of the challenge of continuous improvement. It's like a cycle. You know, it starts with awareness. If you're not aware of what your habits are or what your behavior is, you don't have a chance to change it. Then from that awareness, you go to deliberate practice where you have to effortfully try and work to get better. And eventually the thing that you were deliberately practicing becomes a habit and becomes automatic. But once it becomes automatic, that's not the end. You have to return to awareness and see where you're at now yeah, how and do you start the, the cycle level, yeah. again. Basically, there are these little moments throughout the day. Well, if you, depending on what research study you look at, habits account for 40 to 50% of our daily behaviors. And this is all the stuff that you're just doing without even thinking, you know, tying your shoes or unplugging the toaster after each time you use it or whatever. Um, but the true influence of your habits is even greater than that. Because in many ways, habits are kind of like a fork in the road. They're like a, an entrance ramp on the highway. So you do something mindlessly, like you pull your phone out of your pocket and you don't even think about it. it takes five seconds. But after you do that, it shapes the next like 20 minutes of conscious attention and choices that you're making. So maybe you browse social media or you respond to email or you play a video game. But whatever choice you're making, it was already uh, the context was already shaped by that mindless habit of pulling your phone out. And so I would refer to that as like a decisive moment. They're these little automatic actions that you do them. And then after 30 seconds, they've already shaped the next 20 minutes or the next chunk of time that's going to come. There are a couple ways to think about it, but I would say just quick definition. A habit is a behavior that has been repeated enough times to be performed more or less automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do it pretty much on autopilot. But another way to think about it, and I think this is a useful way to define a habit, is that as you go through life, you face different problems. And some of those problems are big and some of them are small, like you need to tie your shoes. And whenever you face a problem, your brain starts looking for solutions to that. And as you come across solutions to the recurring problems in life, 
you start to automate those. And so every morning you wake up and you put your shoes on and you got this little problem that you need to solve. And pretty soon after you tie your shoes a hundred times or 500 times or a thousand times, you can do it pretty much without thinking. Mm -hmm. And so that's another way of thinking about habits is that they're kind of these like automatic solutions we fall into for whatever the recurring problems are we face. Right. Behavior that becomes habituated. Yeah. And you know, like there, the interesting thing about this is you don't necessarily have to have the same habit to solve a recurring problem. Like if you come home from work each day and you feel stressed and exhausted, one person might uh, play video games for an hour and that's a way to resolve that problem. So they get in the habit of doing it and they just walk over to the controller. They don't even think about it. Another person might go for a run for 20 minutes or meditate for 10 minutes. A third person might smoke a cigarette. And all of those are just solutions to that problem that you're facing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I think, is another powerful lesson is that your original habit is not necessarily the optimal one. And once you realize that, then it kind of becomes your responsibility to become a little more aware of what those habits are and then think about, can you shape them or design them? Right. How much willpower do we have? So... You hear this a lot. I mean, it's very common, especially in self-help, motivation, self-improvement. You need to be motivated. You have to have willpower. Grit and perseverance are huge and important. And it's not that those qualities are not important. It's just that the way to develop them is different than what most people think. So most people think, I need willpower, so I should just try harder. There's an interesting body of research, I mentioned it in the book, I think it's in chapter seven, on self-control and willpower, which is that the people who appear to have the greatest self-control actually are just tempted the least. Mm. So they face temptations less frequently and therefore have the reserves and the resources to resist it when it occasionally comes up. And I think that this is actually like the lever to pull or the pressure point to push on is that the way to get better willpower is to design an environment that tempts you less, not to say, let me just try harder. What is the best first step you found when you share this with people, with leaders to make better decisions, to start those habits? What's the thing that's the stickiest where people go, oh my gosh, yes, I can do that. If you just want something really tactical, just a very specific way to kickstart a habit, I like to recommend the two minute rule. So it's very simple. It just says, take whatever habit you're trying to build and scale it down to something that takes two minutes or less to do. So read 30 books a year becomes read one page. Or do yoga four days a week becomes take out my yoga mat. And sometimes people resist this a little bit. You know, they're like, okay, buddy, you know, I know the real goal isn't just to take my yoga mat out. I know I'm actually trying to do the workout, you know, so this is some kind of mental trick and I know it's a trick, then why would I fall for it basically? And I get where people are coming from, but I have this reader, his name's Mitch. I mentioned him in Atomic Habits and uh, he lost over a hundred pounds. He's kept it off for more than a decade. But when he first started going to the gym, he had this strange little rule for himself where he wouldn't stay for longer than five minutes. So he'd get in the car, drive to the gym, get out, do half an exercise, get back in the car, drive home. And it sounds ridiculous. You know, it sounds silly. You're like, clearly this is not going to work for the guy. But if you take a step back, what you realize is he was mastering the art of showing up. You know, he was becoming the type of person that went to the gym four days a week, even if it was only for five minutes. And I think that's a deep truth about habits. You know, it's something people often overlook, which is a habit must be established before it can be improved. You know, it has to become the standard in your life or in your business before you can scale it up and optimize it and turn it into something more. Standardize before you optimize. And so I think that the two minute rule kind of pushes back on that perfectionist tendency. Just execute a little bit, you know, execute in a small way, get some proof, get some evidence, become the type of person or the type of business that does this consistently, even if it's smaller than what you ultimately hope to do. And then from that new, uh, from that like new foothold that you've established, you can advance and optimize and improve from there. Once you're showing up, there are almost endless opportunities for improvement. But you can have the best plan possible, and if you can't get yourself to show up consistently, it doesn't really matter. So the two-minute rule is perhaps a good place to start. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. 
For some incredible Andrew Huberman motivation, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. And the reward system you start to realize is entirely internal. No one's coming along and cramming dopamine in your ear or dripping it in your brain. It's all internal. And this starts to bring us into the kind of like discussion around mindsets.